good morning uh, welcome to dnb academy program of mr bangur hospital uh, as part of our uh, uh, classes uh, the one part is uh, faculty lecture which is a topic we select from recent ones in surgery because recent ones surgery is a part of a theory exam so i try to cover uh, different topics in uh, recent ones in surgery today uh, we will have a, a presentation on pre malignant lesions of bowel this will be uh, presented by uh, professor sanjay mohan bhattacharya he is professor and head of uh, department of general surgery at ramkrishna shiva pradeshan and bugan institute of medical sciences uh, dr bhattacharya you can share your screen and start good here. morning everybody so uh, this is a very big chapter but even then i will try to give the overview about the pre malignant lesion of the bowel i think uh, everyone can see my share my yes, yes 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 yeah, here visible okay audible and visible yeah what is the pre malignant condition and the pre cancerous condition the who has defined the pre malignant condition as a generalized state associated with the significant increased risk of cancer and the pre cancerous lesion is a morphologically altered tissue in which the cancer is more likely to occur than its normal counterpart what is the importance of identification of the pre malignant lesion the pre malignant lesion of the bowel have regained its importance with the emergence of endoscopic mucosal resection early detection and the treatment and the proper surveillance can improve the patient's outcome in respect to the both mortality and the morbidity as well as it reduces the economic burden so how can we classify the pre malignant lesion of the bowel according to the location it can be related to the small bowel or it can be related to large bowel or the combination of the both of which these are the most uh, the lesions of the large bowel these are the most commonly present and the colorectal adenomas are the most common pre cancerous lesion and relatively easy for screening and the treatment due to the easy accessibility so what are the types of the large bowel pre malignant lesion so it can be divided into an adenomatous polyp or the chronic inflammatory bowel disease so again adenomatous polyp can be divided into the sporadic polyp and the polyp associated with syndrome so like the fap map pujega syndrome lin syndrome juvenile polyposis syndrome and the in the chronic inflammatory disease bowel disease the crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis today we are not discussing about the chronic inflammatory bowel diseases so what is polyp the abnormal proliferation of the mucosal cells leading to the partition of the tissue into the lumen above the surface mucosa around the surrounding mucosa is known as the polyp so what is the significance of identification of the polyp as because we know the adenoma carcinoma sequence so adenoma carcinoma sequence is defined as a set of the recurrent driver mutation in apc keras smad and p53 genes so here so these are the different genes which is available to transfer the normal mucosa into an polyp and ultimately to a cancer so uh, these are nothing but so what happens like this for example the dnb program is basically Uh, organized by makonda but he had the program is along with him the so many faculty members are there whenever these faculty members are there but they are mutated they are changing the driver in the different um, uh, that is the due to their capabilities and it is persistently there then ultimately the your program will be uh, a fulfilled and it will be a good program so here you see the apc here you see the apc deleted here and the apc in apc gene so here 
B catenin mutation is there, KRAS, KRAS is there, and P53 in the different stages, they change the character of the epithelium and ultimately they transform into a malignant lesion. So classification of the polyps. Morphologically, we can classify. This is the sessile polyp. This is the sessile polyp, and this is the pedunculated polyp. But histopathologically, if we see, we can divide it as the neoplastic polyp and the non-neoplastic polyp. So in the neoplastic polyp, according to their histopathology, like the adenoma, so you can divide it into the tubular, which is the 65 to 80%, these are pedunculated, and the villous adenomas, these are 5 to 10%, and they are malignant, and the tubular villous adenoma is 10 to 20%. And non-neoplastic is hematomatous, inflammatory, and the hyperplastic. So this is nothing but uh, Hager's classification. Uh, so this is for the surveillance and the, for the treatment purpose, we should know the level of invasion. If the only the head is involved or the malignancy is confined to the head of the poly, then it is known as the level one. If it is in the junction between the, this is the head and the stalk, this is the level two. And in the stock, anywhere in the stock, this is a level three. And if it is, if it involves the submucosa, then level four. Accordingly, this is for pedunculated poly. If the Haggis classification is done in the uh, sessile poly, you see this is the stage four, straightway stage four, as because it has invaded the submucosa. Again, so. We should keep in our mind the most of the sessile poly, whenever we we'll see the possibility of submucous and involvement is very high. And besides this, another classification is there, which is known as the Kikuchi's classification to see the depth of invasion. This, this can be divided into upper submucous, that is upper one third of the submucous involved. This is known as the SM1. And the middle third of the submucous are in, involved. This is known as the SM2 and SM3 when the entire submucous are involved. This is only related to our management purpose and surveillance. So what is the risk of malignancy? The risk of malignant potential of adenoma depends upon the size. The any polyp, if size is less than one centimeter or one centimeter, this is less likely to be a malignant, but any polyp who is more than the three centimeter chance of malignancy is very high. And the gross types, if the pedunculated polyp, they are generally benign, they will, they can be converted into an, an malignancy, but most of they are benign and the sessile polyp, mostly they are the malignant. And the gross, according to the histology, it can be the villous adenoma, the highest chance of malignancy, Tubular adenoma, yes, chance of malignancy is still there, and the tubular villous adenoma chance of malignancy is there, but even then it is less than the villous adenoma. Grade of dysplasia. So uh, the grade can be the mild, moderate, and the severe. If there is a severe dysplasia, chance of malignancy is very high. And the Haggerty's and Kikuchi's level, so we have discussed. And histopathologically, occasionally, we can see along with the pedunculated polyp, the surface epithelium might be serrated. So these are known as the serrated polyps. And the hyperplastic, it can be divided into the hyperplastic, sessile serrated polyp, and traditional polyp. Hyperplastic polyp is never ever considered as a precancerous. So diagnostic investigation, what are the investigation we can do besides the history, clinical examination? So colonoscopy and the upper G endoscopy and with the advent of new tools, we, can, we should do the endoscopic ultrasound either via rectum or via mouth to detect the depth of invasion. So how can we manage the polyp? There are so many uh, uh, two, uh, types of in management is there. 
the any polyp that is discovered during either colonoscopy or upper GI endoscopy should be excised to characterize its histopathological nature. So technique em employed with the first cell biopsy, we can take the punch by multiple bits. So we can take out the polyp by the snares. It can be again the hot snare and the cold snare. EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection and endoscopic submucosal resection will show the in the picture and followed by surveillance. This is the hot snare polyp and another one on the right side, it is the cold snare polyp. We can excise in that way. So this is for the endoscopic mucosal resection, either by uh, for the sessile poly. We are injecting in the submucosal level the normal saline along with the adrenaline and along with some agent, coloring agent. What is the advantage of putting coloring agent and an adrenaline that will cause the vasoconstriction and the coloring fluid that will detect whether we have excised the entire area of the polyp, then the entire polyp we have excised or not. And if anything that is the complication happens, that is any perforation develops, that color will give us an idea that, uh, that there is no complication. So this is the ultimately retrieval of the by with the forceps. This is the another, the picture what I told, endoscopic mucosal resection. So we can excise in that way. So this is the resector specimen. F is a resector specimen. Here, endoscopic sub resection with the big poly. So you can see the, we have excised after the, the muscle layer, you can see on the right side picture. So pre-malignant lesion of the small bowel. The small bowel adenoma, it constitutes about the 15% of the small bowel tumors. They are commonly the single but maybe the multiple when associated with fat. There are primarily three types. One is true adenoma. 50% is present in the ileum and 30% is jejunum and the 20% in duodenum. The villus adenoma, the rare adenomas, they are seen in the periampular region. Brunner than the adenoma, they are benign and never turn into a malignancy. True and the villus adenoma are considered as a pre-malignant lesion of the small bowel and malignant potential being 35% for true adenomas and 55% of villus adenomas. The FAP associated small bowel adenoma has the 5% risk of development of the malignancy such as the duodenal adenocarcinomas. The management of the small bowel adenoma, true adenoma, endoscopy excision and before that, so we were supposed to do endoscopic ultrasound to see the depth of invasion as I have already discussed. If the muscle coat involved, then we shall have to do the pancreatic adenectomy. So villa adenoma anywhere in the small bowel, they present either intestinal obstruction or they will present as in hemorrhage or if it in the duodenum near the ampulla of the veta, they can present with an obstructive jaundice as well. So US will be done to assess the size and depth of invasion. And then accordingly, we shall have to treat. The malignant potential is 50%. So transduodenal excision or pancreatic duodenal duodenectomy are the surgical options. So a uh, few spice element classification is there, which is done for the assessment or for the treatment as well as the surveillance. So in this classification, there are four criteria, and amongst the four, again, the three points are there according the number of the polyp or the size of the polyp or the histological criteria or the dysplasia. So if you, the, what are the criteria? The polyp number. If the polyp number is one to four, the point is one. If it is, 5 to 20, it is 2 more than 20, it is 3. And the polyp size is 1 to 4 millimeter. So it is 1. 5 to 10, it is 2. And more than 10, it is 3. So histology accordingly. So if you multiply it, the points will come as in 12. So stage 1 will be 0 point. And stage 
sorry, stage zero is a zero point, and stage one is one to four points, and stage three is five to six points, stage three is seven to eight point, and stage four is nine to twelve. So accordingly, the surveillance to be done like that, stage zero and stage one, repeat endoscopy every five years interval, and stage two repeat endoscopy two to three years interval, and stage three and four, so surgical intervention and followed by the repeat endoscopy six to 12 months interval. So large bowel polyps, polyps associated with syndrome, the FAP, MAP, Lean syndrome, and the puth jagger syndrome and the juvenile polyposis. So uh, we'll discuss now about the familial adenomatous polyp. The FAP is an autosomal dominant inherited disease. Incidence is one in 10,000 live births. The ratio of the female and male is equal. The genetic defect is germline mutation in the APC tumor suppressor gene in chromosome number 5Q, codon 21. And depending upon the location of the APC mutation, if it is, it can be classified into two. One is classic polyposis where 100 to thousands of colorectal adenoma will be there, there and the attenuated polyposis that is attenuated FAP where 20 to 100 adenomas will be there in the entire GI tract. So it depends upon the, whether the involvement is there in the before the codon number um, uh, 1250 or it is after that. So lifetime risk of the colorectal carcinoma is near 100% and the fat patient develops colorectal cancer on average age group of 35 years, much, much before the sporadic carcinoma, which develops after the 60. The familial adenomatous polyposis can be extra colonic as well. So it can be divided originating from the uh, mesoderm, that is dermoid tumor, osteoma, and the dental problems. So endodermal, so adenocarcinoma of the duodenum, stomach, intestine, thyroid, biliary, and the liver. And ectodermal, that is epidermal cyst, and pilometrixoma, and congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigmented epithelial and the brain tumors. Different variant associated with the FAP. So it can be associated with the Gardner syndrome, which comprises the osteoma, desmoid tumor, epidermal cyst, and the chronic hypertrophy of the retinal pigmented epithelium, or Turcot syndrome affects the CNS cerebrovascular, that is cerebellar medulloblastoma, glioblastoma, and it is associated with APC. MLH and the PSM, these are nothing but a gene. These are the MMR gene. So diagnostic criteria. So APC gene testing by the protein truncated test. So 80% accurate. And if we do the direct DNA sequencing, it is more or less 95% secure. Money, correct detection we can see in this sequencing. So what is the screening protocol? The colorectal screening, the, it should be with the flexible chronoscope at the age of 12. And if is not there at the age of 12, so we shall have to do colonoscopy one to two hour, two years interval till the age of 35. And after that, three to five years interval till that. If where the number of the polyp is less, colonoscopy should be started at, at the age of 12, 15, 18, and the 21 years, and then every two years interval. So as because FEP is associated with the other many polyps and the other sites of the GI tract, so upper GI endoscopy should be started at the age of 20 to 25 years of age. And as per the Spiegelman classification staging discussed earlier, USG of the thyroid and abdomen to be done to exclude the malignancy and the despoid tumor. Then management of the fat. What is the aim? 
the prevention of death from that cancer and to maximize the quality of life. So decision of surgery depends upon the presence of symptom, age of diagnosis, and individual characteristics. Time of symptoms, time of surgery, the presence of symptoms, if patient presents with the symptoms, then we should do as early as possible. If the patient is asymptomatic and the mild disease like the AFAP, discuss the opportunity of operation after the age of 20, as because the before 20, there is less likely chance of development of colorectal malignancy. And patient diagnosed in the third decade, so we should do immediate surgery. Severe disease at the colonoscopy, so as soon as possible, surgery to be done. The surgical options available, so total colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis, with or without rectal mucosectomy, so restorative proctocolectomy with ileal pouch and alan anastomosis, total proctocolectomy and end ileostomy, minimal excess intervention for the same procedures. And the post-operatives I am not going to discuss about as because it, is, it will take more much time. So post-operative surveillance, so we should do colonoscopy and upper GI endoscopy. So uh, this is the new thing which is coming up. The NSID can be used in the prevention of the polyprogression in fat. Sulindac, 300 milligram 12 hourly or the aspirin 325 milligram OD can be used for the prevention of progression of the polyps. So MAP, MAP is an autosomal recessive inherited syndrome. The germline mutation of the both the alleles of the MAP gene located in the chromosome number one, both the parents of the affected individual must be at least monoallelic or biallelic. The CRC risk is increased 28 fold in individual with the biallelic MAP gene mutation as CRC risk of the monoallelic carrier appears to be a bit high, but it is less than 28 fold. The colonic phenotype mimic that of the AFAP. And in MAP, the most of the polyps are adenomatous, but can present with serrated, a mixture of the serrated and the adenomatous polyp. In MAP, in most of the cases, the polyp number is between 100, you know, 10 to 100. That's why, so we shall have to think of whether it is an AFAP or it is a MAP. So we shall have to differentiate and we can differentiate it by doing the DNA sequencing. So colorectal poly are found at the age of 40s. In reference, in, in contrast, the FAP is at the early age. So 20% of the patient with MAP develops duodenal poly and most of the CRC develop between the age of 40 to 60. So MAP, Indication of MAP gene testing, the patient with 10 to 100 polyp. So siblings of patient with biallelic mutation and the patient with the early onset of cancer before the age of 45 and the children of monoallelic or biallelic MAP gene carrier. Screening, patient with MAP should undergo colonoscopy every one to two year interval and upper GI endoscopy for paleomporary or duodenal carcinoma at the age of 30 and followed by three to five years interval. Treatment, endoscopic resection, subtotal colectomy or ileorectal with ileorectal anastomosis. If rectal cancer has already developed, then this is ile I mean, total proctocolectomy with ileorectal anal anastomosis with or without pouch. Lean syndrome, or it is also known as the HNPCC. So incidence three to 5% of all the CRC and 10 to 
19% of all the CLC diagnosed before the age of 50. So mean age of development is 40 to 60 years, whereas the sporadic carcinoma, it develops after 60. So it is an autosomal dominant inherited disease. Mutation is seen in one of the DNA, that is MMR gene, that is mismatch repair gene, MMR gene. This one K MLH1 and MSH2 and MSH6 and PMS2 and EP scan. So lifetime risk of the CRC is 70% for men and 40% for the women. Extra colonic cancer in Lynn syndrome are endometrial adenocarcinoma, the most common between the age of 30 to 45. The ovary, stomach, small intestine, urinary tract, brain, pancreas, and the sebaceous carcinoma as well. So extra colonic non-cancer manifestations are sebaceous adenoma, keratoacanthoma, is seen in the mutore variant of Lynch syndrome. So clinical diagnosis. So clinical diagnosis can be done by Amsterdam two criteria or the modified Amsterdam criteria. And that is the criteria for the surveillance and the management. So germline sequencing of MMR gene remains the gold standard for the diagnosis. And what is the Amsterdam 2 criteria or modified Amsterdam criteria? At least three relatives must have a cancer associated hereditary non-polyposis cancer, namely colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, the stomach cancer, pancreatic, etc., plus along with the falling. The one must be the first degree relative of the other two. At least two successive generations must be affected, and at least one of the relatives with HNPCC associated cancer must have diagnosed before the age of 50, and the FAP to be excluded and pathological diagnosis of the cancer is verified. So what is the Bethesda criteria? So this is nothing but for the micro satellite instability. The CFC diagnosed before the age of 50 and the presence of synchronous or metacredous colorectal malignancy or other HNPCs related tumors like the endometrial, renal, stomach, ureter, and the pancreas, regardless of the age. So CRC associated with MSI histopathology, that is presence of tumor infiltration by the lymphocyte or mucinous or signet differentiation diagnosed in patient before the age of 60. So CRC in at least one first degree relative, with an HNPCC related cancer diagnosed before the age of 50 years. And the CRC diagnosed at least two first or the second degree relatives with HNPC related tumor regardless of the age. Screening colonoscopy is recommended in person at risk, that is, first degree relative. Those affected with the limb syndrome start colonoscopy at the age of 20 years and followed by two to five year interval before the youngest or before the youngest age of CRC in the family diagnosed before the age of 25. So any patient in the family, is there any history that it has developed before the age of 25? So we shall have to think of at least the five years before or two to three years before we shall have to check with the colonoscopy. For MMR germline mutation positive patient, annual colonoscopy. For extra colonic cancer screening should be done at the age of the 30 to 35 years. And the screening for the gastric cancer at the age of 30 to 35 years. So what is the treatment? So again, the total colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis is preferred. So Lynch plus rectal cancer, if it develops, the based on the standard oncological principle as in sporadic rectal cancer. So follow-up screening, annual colonoscopy. 
Pujega syndrome, autosomal dominant hereditary cancer syndrome. So mutation is found serine threonine 11, sorry, sorry, serine threonine kinase 11 or LKB1 gene located in chromosome number 19. The lifetime risk of the cancer is 39%. First degree relative of Pujega syndrome has 50% chance of malignancy and primarily the GI polyp are hamartomas and the mucocutaneous pigmentation, it can be dark blue or the brown in the marmalade border or the buccal mucosa or the hands and feet. So high predisposition of intestinal that is most common, that is the colony and the extraintestinal changes, that is lung, breast, uterine, testicular, ovary, and cancers. So who criteria of the clinical diagnosis of PJS? So three or more histologically confirmed Pujega syndrome poly. So these are the hamartomatous poly. So any number of the Pujega syndrome poly with a family history of Pujega syndrome, any number of the Pujega syndrome poly characteristic of mucocutaneous pigmentation and the characteristics mucocutaneous pigmentation within a family history of the Pujega syndrome. So these are the criteria to diagnose the Pujega syndrome. So screening intestinal. So it should begin at the age of eight to 10 years of age, evaluation of the small bowel, and the repeat evaluation of the small bowel at the age of 18. If the first evaluation is negative, then we should do every two to three years interval colonoscopy. At the age of 18 years, that is the late teens, and repeat every two to three years interval. Pancreatic cancer evaluation by EUS and the MRCP at the age of 25 to 30 years and extra intestinal testicular evaluation at the age of 10 years for germline for the females pelvic examination at the 18 to 20 years breast examination breast examination every two to three years and the mammography and MRI breast above the age of 25 years. What is the treatment? If the Pujega syndrome is asymptomatic, then gastric and colonic polyp is more than one centimeter, then endoscopic removal. If the patient is symptomatic, generally these people present with an intestinal obstruction or the bleeding. The gold standard surgery is to remove the effective segment, preserving the as much bowel as possible. So, juvenile polyposis syndrome, it is an autosomal dominant hereditary cancer. Poly develops before the age of 20. It is associated with the mutation of the SMAT4 in chromosome number 18. And BMPR1 gene in chromosome number, I think it is 19. So histologically, the juvenile polyposis are predominantly hamartomas, but they contain adrenomatous element as well. The malignant potential is 10%. So juvenile polyp, when to diagnose, a person of any one of the following should be diagnosed as juvenile polyposis coli or juvenile polyposis syndrome. More than five juvenile polyp, either in the colon or the rectum, multiple juvenile polyp in other parts of the GI tract, any number of the juvenile polyp with the family history. So that should be considered as a juvenile polyposis syndrome. So juvenile polyposis syndrome can be again divided into three types according to their signs and symptoms. So juvenile polyposis of the infancy and the children, polyp are seen throughout the intestine and they are 
presenting as an diarrhea and protein losing enteropathy. This is a severe form of the disease and outcome is the poorest. And generalized juvenile polyposis, this is the most common type of the polyp. And the polyps anywhere in the GI tract, GI bleeding, and the intersubstitution is the commonest symptoms. Juvenile polyposis colic. This is the affected individual develop polyp only in the colon. They presence with their GI bleed. So associated abnormalities are approximately 15% of the people with juvenile polyposis syndrome have intestinal malnutrition, uh, sorry, malrotation, cleft palate, polydactyly, heart and brain anomalies. Then what is the treatment? The patient will few juvenile polyp, endoscopic polypectomy, patient with the numerous polyp, colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis and endoscopic surveillance of the rectum. And the Patient with diffuse form of the polyposis in the rectum, restorative proctocolectomy with ileal pouch anal anastomosis. Thank you. I think I have covered the chapter, one whole chapter, but I didn't go elaborately to this. Yeah, thank you. Robert, thank you. Uh, it's an extensive discussion on uh, premedical lesion, particularly the uh, polyps in the uh, GIT. And another area was uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but it is a clear description of all the bowel. And one important thing is uh, large bowel can be diagnosed easily, but the challenging area is small bowel. Yes. Patient is presenting with some bleeding and upper GI, lower GI endoscopy is normal. Then it is difficult to find the small bowel polyps. Now we have more advanced gadgets being available in the form of capsule endoscopy or uh, uh, small bowel enteroscopy, which now is allowing us to diagnose the small bowel polyps early. That's true. Second is uh, in Piers Jagger's polyp, uh, these Piers Jagger polyps are more frequent in the small bowel. And it is said that the Piers Jagger polyp principle of treatment is only the symptomatic polyp has to be excised. Otherwise, if you do a radical surgery for Piers Jagger polyp, uh, patient will have land up with uh, short gut syndrome. So, so any, that's any... why I discussed. Uh, this is the conservative management yes. like that. Yes, the segment yes. of polyp, the segment of intestine involved. Yeah. So the symptomatic polyp uh, to be addressed because uh, you cannot remove the whole or small bowel, uh, and the risk of malignancy is there, but less than other polyposis. In in PS is about twenty to thirty percent, I think. Yes. Uh, any any question from uh, I do not find any question in the chat box. Uh, any any comment from any other faculties? Uh, actually, in exam they need to give a uh, good summary of this uh, presentation. Yeah, so that's why I didn't go elaborately as because yeah, yeah. so many things are there, advantages, what to do, uh, restorative proctocolectomy, what is the advantage and disadvantages, everything. So we didn't discuss that one as because if we discuss that one, it will be time consuming. That's yeah. why I kept it in short. Yeah. Madam, any input? <laughs> Nothing, sir. Just wanted to thank Dr. Bhatchaj. Uh, yeah. it was, good, it morning, was, uh, huh. good morning, morning ma'am. Good, good morning. Good morning, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, okay, then. If, uh, yes, okay. Dr. Yeah. yeah. So if no other discussion, then we can offer. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.